So this, this will be another presentation. You may get lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes. If you get an axillary lymph node in any child or any person, see what for you, you usually don't get axillary lymph nodes. You would get cervical, you would get inguinal. If you get axillary lymph nodes, one centimeter fine, but if you get larger size, then there is something wrong. It's pathological, it's not normal. Uh, if you get a child with delayed development and you do the CT scan, you will see basal ganglia calcification. So, basal ganglia calcification is two things, toxoplasma, HIV. These are the two things you will keep in mind. And you will see cerebral atrophy. So cerebral atrophy is also a sign of HIV. And obviously a child can come as tuberculous meningitis. So these can be presentations that are there. Now in this child you can see cerebral atrophy. More marked cerebral atrophy. And because of that the ventricles appear dilated. There is no hydrocephalus. This is ventricular medial. So this will be a classical HIV presentation of cerebral atrophy. You will see tuberculosis just not healing, just not healing, finally forming bronchic cases or you can get a lung abscess sitting here. So all these presentations when you see, think of any infection that appears severe, normal infection that appears severe, think of immunodeficiency. Any unusual infection if you get, think of immunodeficiency. So what we see is without a period of uh, progression is uh, to age is 3.5 years and most of them have opportunistic infections at a younger age. So this was the WHO classification that I told you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 is asymptomatic, 2 is mild, 3 is advanced and 4 is severe. We call 8 when you are in 4. Now, when we practice as a, doing HIV, what is our aim of our practice? Our aim is that we want to prevent this. We want to prevent all these complications. So prevention is the most important thing. Western Europe and America are not seeing new pediatric HIV. Because their vertical transmission is less than 500 new cases a year. So for a, such a huge population, if I am getting only 500 children who are becoming positive, my pediatric uh, HIV is almost negligible. What problems they are seeing are of intravenous drug abuse and sexual transmission in the adolescents. So they are really not seeing pediatric uh, HIV. And this is what we have to strive for in our country. We have to strive for not getting HIV in children. So the prevention becomes the most important thing. Obviously, if you uh, come across an infected child, then you have to manage the infection. Yes? What's the percentage of uh, vertical transmission? Yeah, vertical transmission, untreated mother, you get a transmission rate of 35 to 40 percent. So if a mother is not treated at all, the chance that her baby will become positive is 35 to 40 percent. With prevention, the rate can come down to less than 1%. It can't become 0%. It can come down to 1%, less than 1%. So that's what our goal should be. And uh, obviously, if you're going to treat one person, don't treat one person. Treat the entire family. Because what will happen is if you treat one, they finish their resources and then they don't have money for the other clients. So entire family has to be treated. Now, management of HIV involves first is a diagnosis. The diagnosis I'm going to take uh, in the next uh, lecture, but there are problems of diagnosis in HIV. And why I'm emphasizing that? Because you're going to label somebody as HIV positive. So we don't want to label anyone as HIV positive for the rest of his life. So we have to be very sure that he is positive or she is positive and then go accordingly. So we are not going to label them <coughs> without a proper diagnosis. Now the other problems that they have and what we need to take care is they are OI. So first is we need to prevent. We should not get OI. If they are getting OI, then we need to treat them. We have to take care of the organ dysfunctions that are taking place, cardiomyopathy and cathelopathy. We have to ensure that they lead a normal lifestyle. Most of the times when I am asked for a, a sickness certificate, I cannot write zero positive. I have to write whatever associated problem they have on that medical certificate. So if they have TB, I have to write this child is suffering from TB. Or if he is failing to try, then I have to write that he is suffering from malnutrition. I cannot try the diagnosis of zero positive state. Even when I uh, take rounds, we have to make sure that we don't speak HIV word in front of the parents. So we speak it as retroviral disease. Because it's a retrovirus. So we talk about as retroviral disease. The OPD that we run at Varia is not called as uh, HIV OPD. It's called as a new wing OPD. 
new way of being. So that uh, when a patient comes there, nobody should say, oh, this OB that means these are all HIV positive patients. No. It's a new way of being. So that all these things you have to take off, care, care of. When we have medical representatives, the MRs coming, we have to make sure that they don't come while the patients are there. So they have to come at a different time when the patients are not there. So all these issues, they are small things, but they really go uh, longer in the run to maintain their privacy and their dignity. So that is very important. After doing all this, you know, prevention of OI, treating OI, organ dysfunction, ensuring lifestyle, then comes the antiretroviral therapy. Antiretroviral therapy is not the first thing for an HIV positive. If we have a clinic, right now uh, we have around uh, 700 children. Out of that, we would have children on ARTs maybe around 100 or 150. The remaining would not be on ARTs because they don't need ART. They are still not at a stage where we need to start them on ART. So we just need to follow them up and ensure the other problems are not occurring. Antiretroviral therapy, remember, are toxic drugs. The first drug that was discovered was Zydomodin. Zydomodin was a drug that was discovered as an anti-cancer drug. And incidentally, it was found to work for HIV. So that's how the drug came for use for HIV. So you can imagine if an anti-cancer drug is being used as an anti-HIV medicine for the kind of toxicity that these drugs have. So these drugs really have a lot of side effects. So we don't want to encourage those kind of side effects. Now comes your co-trimoxazole prophylaxis. In adults, we don't give them co-trimoxazole prophylaxis until unless they've had a PCP pneumonia in the past. So it becomes secondary prophylaxis. Whereas in children we give primary prophylaxis. So all children go on to co-trimoxazole prophylaxis because as I said opportunistic infections are more common in children. PCP pneumonia is more common in the less than one year. So if you have a child who is an infant, everybody gets co-trimoxazole. If CD4 comes in though, you continue co-trimoxazole even beyond one year of age. After one year of age, if the CD4 count normalizes, you may consider stopping co-trimoxazole. But it's usually safer to continue you not only prevent PCP, but you prevent bacterial infection, you prevent toxoplasmosis uh, also. So this has to be continued. Now prevention of opportunistic infection. The commonest opportunistic infection that we see is PCP, candida, oral thrush, TB. We see atypical TB a lot in HIV. Surprisingly, we don't see that in uh, non-HIV population, but we see mycobacterium avian complex a lot in HIV positive patients and obviously bacterial infection. Among the viral CMV, CMV retinitis is common, not anything else. So usually you will see, like just like you see in a transplant patient or a patient on cancer treatment, suddenly with chemotherapy the CMV flares up. All of us have CMV in our system. All of us have the virus sitting there. But it doesn't cause a problem to us. It's only when our immunity goes down that the virus flares up. So they are more prone to get uh, CMV retinitis. How this gospel we see is very common. In fact, uh, most of the parents nowadays are very uh, smart. If you ask them, you, if they know that you are suspecting HIV, and you ask them, did you, did you ever have any medical problems? No, we never had. Did you have TB in the past? No, we never had. They don't correlate herpes zoster with HIV. So if you ask them, did you have herpes zoster, they immediately come out with that history. Yes, we have herpes zoster. So one marker that we get is herpes zoster. And you ask the parents for peace roster, they come out with a history and you know this child is HIV positive. So that is one way of diagnosing. Chicken pox discriminated you get. From the infections we usually get oral thrush. Cryptococcal meningitis, surprisingly I see more common in non-HIV children than I see in HIV. Though your boss will mention cryptococcal meningitis is very common in HIV. In children we don't see this. Penicilliosis is more common in the northeast part of our country. It's not seen in this part of the country. Protocol infections, toxoplasma, again, not so common in children. They come with an SOL in the brain. But they don't come, uh, more common in the adults than the children. Cryptosporidia is something we see routinely nowadays. Uh, any child with watery diarrhea nowadays we send students for cryptosporidia, even normal child. And yes, in cryptosporidia. So it's very, very common. So I wouldn't now say that cryptosporidia is more common in nature. It's common in the normal population also. Except that in normal population it is self-limiting. It does not persist. Whereas in case of HIV positive patients, it will be chronic persistent diarrhea. So this for it is common. So how do we ensure that we don't get these uh, infections? 
First is nutrition because uh, most of them are malnourished. If we can bring up the nutrition, micro and micronutrients, we'll prevent a lot of uh, immune deficiency problems. Immunization for all vaccines. The only contraindication for a vaccine is BCG, which we don't uh, avoid. We can't avoid because we give it at birth. And at birth, we don't know whether this child is positive or negative. The other thing is NMR and measles. Now, NMR and measles are immunosuppressive vaccines. So if you are giving, going to give it to a child who has got a low CD4 count, then there is a chance that he will develop some infection. So if you want to give NMR and measles, do a CD4 count. If CD4 count is normal, then give the vaccine. Otherwise, bring it up by giving ART, then give the vaccine. So don't be in a hurry to give those two vaccines. If your child can afford, give the optional vaccine, the wave vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, chicken pox, etc. etc. Give those vaccines in these children. I'm not talking about normal children. I'm talking about these children that you will be, if they are affording. If they can't afford, obviously you can't give it. Ask them to boil and filter water. Your uh, cryptosporidia basically does not get uh, affected by boiling. So you need to, and they are larger uh, cysts, so you need to filter them. So they need to boil and filter. Both the things they need to do. Not only boiling or not only filter. So aquaval is not enough. Boiling is not enough. They have to do both the things. So that is what you need to tell them. And co trinoxidal and propylation and then keep on screening them for OI. Now organ dysfunction. I will tell you the cases that we have had. Organ dysfunction that you get. Let's talk about a hematological case. Now this is a 13 year old child. She presented to the hematopoly with bleeding gums and weight loss. And she had a blood transfusion twice at 5 years for anyway. Nowadays I see a lot of this unknown transfusion. Their parents are negative and the child is positive. And then you go into the past three, one blood transfusion was given sometime for anyway. So this is a very common cause and we should try and avoid this problem. We should not be uh, giving unnecessary blood transfusion. She has received AKT at 4 years for 9 months. So now she is 13 years. On examination she has hematosplenum megalogic with pallor. She went to the hematopathy, they found that she has pancytopenia, her CD4 count was 211. So, because of aplastic anemia, they screened her for secondary causes and they found that she was positive. Then the bone marrow was done, it was aplastic. So now, this was the bone marrow. 